morning. Tom asked me to talk a little bit about my experiences in the civil rights movement in honor of Martin Luther King Day. It's good that we honor Dr. King. He was a poetic speaker, and he was able to explain the movement to people who didn't understand. <laughs> but today I'd like to focus on the, the local people, the ordinary, everyday people of the Deep South who endured so much and who made the movement possible. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was formed in 1960 at Shaw University, and they, along with the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, were the main organizers in Mississippi. In the early 60s, Mississippi was, conditions were terrible for black people. In 1964, Mississippi was the poorest state in the nation. What does this mean? It means that people in rural areas and in some towns lived in shacks with no running water and no electricity. Water came from a well and had to be carried in for cooking and washing. Children in the Delta had running sores on their legs and were not able to wash. These children missed the school in the spring and fall because they were busy chopping cotton in the spring and picking cotton in the fall. They had to work for the family to survive. The diet was sparse with beans and fatback, the main source of protein. Many of you have seen poverty conditions in the third world. Rural Mississippi was the third world. African Americans were 48% of the population, but only 5% were registered to vote. They had no say in making decisions about the system that controlled their lives. When they did try to register, there was a poll tax and a so-called literacy tax, a literacy test where they had to recite parts of the Mississippi Constitution without error. White people were not required to do this. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, had worked for two and a half years to educate black people about registering to vote. They practiced filling out forms and the tests they would have to take. And they were attacked either by police with billy clubs and dogs on the spot or by the KKK at night when they got home. They had their insurance canceled. They were fired from their jobs. Their homes were shot into or burned, and sometimes they were lynched. These organizers were harassed and intimidated. Sometimes they were sent to prison farms and sometimes tortured. Some jails had a hot box that was six feet by six by six, which was all metal with no way to get air in except a slit under the door. When they turned on the heat, it got really bad. Black people in Mississippi were also excluded from the regular Democratic Party because the same people that control the courthouses control the Democratic Party. They were excluded from the whole political process and had no say over economic and political decisions that control their lives. In 1963, there was an election for state offices, and SNCC organized a freedom vote. The mock election was open to everyone. The purpose was to educate people about how an election worked. There was a registration form and SNCC workers fanned out in congressional districts to register voters, black and white, for the freedom vote. The election was held in October in the Masonic Temple in Jackson, and they formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or the MFDP. Following this, in 1964, SNCC, which was responsible for three of the congressional districts, and core for the other two, 
set up projects for the MFDP in towns and villages all over Mississippi. They began to recruit college students, black and white, to come to Mississippi for the summer of 64. Freedom Summer, it was called. Maybe some of you were there. The MFDP held precinct meetings and district meetings and elected delegates to the United States Congress and to the National Convention. Everything was done according to procedures set up by the National Party. And then in August, several busloads of people from Mississippi arrived in Atlantic City for the National Democratic Convention. They asked to be seated and the regular Democrats to be unseated. This is where I met these courageous people and it changed my life. <clears throat> One of them came up to me while we were in the street and asked me if I had had enough to eat that day. And of course I had, but it dawned on me that if he was asking me that, there were others who had not had enough to eat that day. It changed my life to be with these people. You can't imagine the wheeling and dealing that went on in the top layers of the Democratic Party. But friendly congressmen helped us, and but President Lyndon Johnson tried to stop the press from telling our story. The Credentials Committee held hearings, and Mississippians told about their experience trying to register to vote. Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony moved me the most. She worked on a plantation as the person who weighed the cotton that had been picked that day. She testified that after she went to register to vote in Ruleville, Mississippi, <clears throat> she went home and found that she had been fired from the job she had had on the plantation for 27 years and the family had been kicked out of their home. Then she also told about how on the way home from a workshop on voter registration, she was arrested and brutally beaten in the jail in Winona, Mississippi. She was beaten for several hours on her body by, with a blackjack. After being with these Mississippians, I decided that I wanted my life to be with them. I wanted to be a revolutionary like they were. And the student, and I went to work for the MFDP and SNCC. I went door to door and talked to people about voting. I helped the volunteer lawyers with their court, who came to Mississippi from the National Lawyers Guild with their court reporters and took depositions and affidavits from the local people who had been harassed and beaten up and shot at for trying to register to vote. These people were not stars with name recognition. They were ordinary people like you and me. It was a dangerous business to try to vote in Mississippi, but their courage and persistence should be an inspiration for all of us. We're facing some of the same conditions today. There are things you can do to protest our legally elected state legislature and our illegitimate president. Today I celebrate Dr. King and the local people of Mississippi, and I celebrate this congregation for, the, for its work on social justice. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking Margaret for allowing me and trusting me to tell parts of her life story in the form of a sermon. Margaret is humble and is not a seeker after attention. And I want to let you know that she tried many times to dissuade me from doing this service. And so I want to offer her my apologies um, for having to put up with my stubbornness and my persistence. 
When I was in my first year as the brand new minister here at this church, and Margaret was a brand new member of this church, she was the very first in our congregation to invite me to a Forward Together um, Moral Monday event. She swung by the church, I think it was on a, I think it was on a Wednesday morning, and drove me down, ta- down over to downtown Raleigh, where William Barber was leading a press conference. And as we entered the room, the leaders of the NAACP all looked over and, and waved. And in the next couple of minutes, I think all of them had made their way over to, to give Margaret a great big hug and hello. And I thought, who is this woman? <laughs> A few minutes ago, you heard the story of how she entered the movement. She was attending the the 1964 Democratic National Convention in in Atlantic City as a reporter's assistant and was witnessing that conflict between those attempting to integrate the Democratic Party and those attempting to keep it segregated. And you heard how Margaret was there when Miss Fannie Lou Hamer spoke at a press conference and described the brutal violence she endured in her attempt to participate in democracy. And it was during this press conference that Margaret had a conversion experience, an epiphany that would change her life forever as she decided in her own words, I want my life to be with these people. Margaret joined up with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. SNCC, by the way, was founded in 1960 as an inspired response to the student-led sit-ins at lunch counters in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I might parenthetically say that it was those same Greensboro sit-ins that would inspire the work right here to desegregate Chapel Hill, work led first by African-American youth and then by students at the university with the help of religious leaders, our own minister in the 1960s, Charlie Jones, along with several members of our church played a role in supporting this push to pressure restaurants and other businesses up and down Franklin Street and all around Chapel Hill to become integrated in the 1960s. SNCC was at the center of many of the efforts to win civil rights victories during the 60s. It dispatched freedom riders across the South to conduct sit-ins and to organize campaigns to challenge racial discrimination and disenfranchisement. Its leading members were a who's who of this era, included Stokely Carmichael, Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, Ella Baker, Marion Barry, Bernice Johnson Reagan, and Julian Bond. One time as I sat with Margaret, I I had to ask her. I, I ticked through names of the civil rights movement. Did you ever meet Martin Luther King? I met him once, she said. Did you ever meet Malcolm X? No, I never had the opportunity to meet him. And then John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael. And by this point, Margaret was getting annoyed with me. (laughs) She really draws no distinction, no distinction between the person in front at the microphone, that identified leader, and the person just doing their bit, their piece, to make the world a little better. The person waiting to pick up and feed the student jailed for weeks after they sat in. One of Margaret's first assignments with SNCC was to travel to a little town you may have heard of, the town of Selma, where she pretended to be a reporter and interviewed the mayor in order to gather information to inform the voting rights struggle that would soon commence there in earnest. Margaret was in Selma when Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed. Later in 1965, SNCC began to change Stokely Carmichael began to articulate the foundations of black pride. Black is beautiful. Black power. And this articulation involved the concept that organizations working for black liberation should be led by and run by African Americans. And to Margaret, that made a lot of sense. So she and other whites left SNCC voluntarily. And many of them went to work attempting to organize whites around race and class, awaiting that promised day when blacks and whites would unite in a world with justice. And in this stage of her life, Margaret moved with a small group of organizers to Pikeville, Kentucky, a small, poor coal mining town in Appalachia. She moved there in 1967, inspired by the anti-racism efforts of Carl and Ann Braden. They moved there with the hopes of organizing poor whites, But it wasn't long before they encountered resistance. 
the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Pikeville, announced that he wouldn't have out-of-towners trying to rile up our poor people. Our poor people. He said this as if he owned them. And then Margaret and her friends were red-baited, accused of being communists, which was perhaps true, but this isn't the point. In 1967, police raided the house where Margaret, her husband, and her movement friends were living, confiscated their books, letters, pamphlets, and other literature, and arrested them on the charge of sedition, of plotting to overthrow the government of the United States. Margaret, who was five months pregnant at the time, spent a week in jail before their group could get released. As the legal, pro- as the legal proceedings began, the United States Congress became involved. John McClellan, the senator from Arkansas, used his position with the, sermon, uh, with the Senate Perman- Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, which existed as a continuation of, of McCarthyism, to demand that uh, to demand that, that Margaret and her friends turn over their books, pamphlets, magazines, newsletters, diaries, love letters to Congress. They burned them instead. And for this, they were found to be in contempt of Congress. As Margaret says, this was true. They did hold Congress in contempt. <laughs> And in December of that year, December of 1967, as Margaret, her husband, and her infant son slept inside their home, six sticks of dynamite were placed outside their house and exploded. Fortunately, miraculously, Margaret's family survived intact. And as shocking as it is, this violence against those in the civil rights movement was not at all rare. We know, we know the story of the four black girls who died in 1963 when the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham was bombed. But we forget or or we never learned that hundreds and hundreds of bombs were used in the South in the 1960s to attempt to terrorize those who were working for racial justice, civil rights, voting rights, and desegregation. Today, we associate frequent terrorist bombings and improvised explosive devices with places like Baghdad or Kabul. But we forget how throughout the South, these bombs were used, sometimes on a daily basis, to target centers of the African-American community and the leaders working for civil rights and the families, the families of those hoping to bring about change. It wasn't until 18 years later that all of the legal cases stemming from the arrest were settled. And at the end of the legal process, the Kentucky anti-sedition law under which Margaret was charged was ruled unconstitutional, and Margaret won damages against the state of Kentucky for violating her constitutional rights. She used these meager winnings to go on to graduate school, earning a master's in international education from American University in Washington, D.C., in entering the next chapter of her life, first as an ESL teacher, then in Wilmington, North Carolina, involved in environmental work, and then coming to live in Chapel Hill or in Carborough a few years ago, where she joined our church and invited me to go with her to my first Moral Monday event. So why do I tell Margaret's story, this story of someone who hates to be at the center of attention and is thoroughly mortified that I'm telling it? It's not to privilege her experience over others. And it's not to look in the rearview mirror to someday 50 years ago, because our lives become stuck if we live in the past. But our lives are stuck as well if we don't learn from it. Rather, I tell Margaret's story as a way of reminding ourselves of the power of our own stories, the way we can use our own lives to promote the fair and the right and the just. I do find her story inspiring, literally literally bringing the spirit in, inspiring and encouraging, of of buoying my heart. There's a spiritual lesson here as well. I asked Margaret about her religious upbringing and learned that she comes from a line of religious leaders. Her grandfather was a Baptist missionary, her father a Baptist minister with a Ph.D. in Greek, 
And Margaret told me about her religious evolution, how, how the metaphysical claims about Jesus never made sense to her, even as the life and ministry of Jesus stuck and resonated as worthy of emulation. How the theologizing of Paul never really made sense even as the dedication and commitment of Paul, his willingness to bear the cost of persecution for doing what he felt was right, made utmost sense to her. And so this morning on this Martin Luther King weekend, we remember stories, stories of SNCC and civil rights, of Greensboro sit-ins and freedom summers, the testimony of Miss Fanny Lou Hamer, and the courage of Martin Luther King, and the commitment here locally of Charlie Jones, of the prophetic life of the Bradens, and the grassroots power of the movement. But more than that, we tell this story amidst the hundreds of thousands and millions of stories of people living their life, of doing what they can to bring about a world more fair. And it is in this remembering that we are blessed. And it's in this learning that we are blessed. Amen.